Brothers and sisters in Christ, it's my joy to turn your attention to the Old Testament major prophet of Isaiah. We're going to begin reading at Isaiah 52 at verse 13, and then we'll read all 12 verses of the 53rd chapter. Hear then the reading of God's holy and infallible word. Behold, my servant shall act wisely. He shall be high and lifted up and shall be exalted. As many were astonished at you, his appearance was so marred beyond human semblance and his form beyond that of the children of mankind. So shall he sprinkle many nations. Kings shall shut their mouths because of him. For that which has not been told them they see, and that which they have not heard they understand. Who has believed what he has heard from us? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a young plant, and like a root out of dry ground. He had no form or majesty that we should look at him, and no beauty that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And as one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his wounds, we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted. Yet he opened not his mouth like a lamb that is led to the slaughter. And like a sheep that before its shears is silent, so he opened not his mouth. By oppression and judgment, he was taken away. And as for his generation, who considered that he was cut off out of the land of the living, stricken for the transgression of my people? And they made his grave with the wicked and with a rich man in his death. Although he had done no violence, And there was no deceit in his mouth. Yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him. He has put him to grief. When his soul makes an offering for guilt, he shall see his offspring. He shall prolong his days. The will of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. Out of the anguish of his soul, he shall see and be satisfied by his knowledge. Shall the righteous one, my servant, make many to be accounted righteous, and he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will divide him a portion with the many, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out his soul to death and was numbered with the transgressors. Yet he bore the sin of many and makes intercession for the transgressors. May the Lord God bless the reading and the teaching of his holy word. Thank you so much for the joy of being back with our fellowship here in Dallas, Texas at Believer's Chapel. As you know, I have uh, deep roots of love that go back to my seminary years here when Dr. Johnson was teaching and I knew these young guys, Dan Duncan and Mike Black as fellow classmates. I see Frank C. out there, too. Uh, These are brothers in the Lord. Good to see you all again, and thank you for the honor to be together with you. I'm asking you, if you would, to turn again to the uh, Old Testament prophet of Isaiah. We'll be looking again at Isaiah 52, verses 13 and following, throughout then the 53rd chapter. Now, as we study this extraordinary section of Scripture that is often called the suffering servant oracles, I believe we are every bit as much on holy ground as when Moses stood at the burning bush with the I am that I am. We're every bit as much as on holy ground as young Joshua met the captain 
of the Lord's armies. And he said, take off your shoes. The ground you're standing on is holy. So in your hearts today, I would ask that you might symbolically take off the shoes of your life. Banish from your mind the things of this world, the cares that are part of all of our lives, things that distract us. And let's come to a holy place that is in the very inner sanctum of God's redemptive purposes. I would ask you here to again encounter a theological treasure trove of realities that tell us about the suffering servant who is the Messiah that saves God's people from their horrendous sin, all spoken 800 years before the Lord Jesus Christ ever came to be with us on earth. It's my prayer today that through our study that you will once again encounter the amazing reality of our salvation, planned, described, and prophesied, not just in time, but from eternity past in the counsels of God. And perhaps again you will sing, Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. The great words of John Newton. Or, amazing love can it be that my God should die for me. The Charles Wesley anthem. That once again you, you will sense the extraordinary reality of what the Lord God has determined to do. That he might have a people called by his name. Here we are encountering, if you will, the utterly amazing truth of a sovereign God saving desperately sinful people to be his own. As we do this, I'm sorry I can't give you a three-point sermon today. I'm going to give you a 12-point sermon. <laughs> Maybe you can look at it as a fourfold benediction, a blessing. Now, I recognize I have to make it fit into the time that's allotted, so I'll try to keep it precise. But I hope you'll take notes and jot down each of the thoughts because you are coming to a mountain that should be transfiguring for you. You're coming to Golgotha, to the mountain of the living God, where on that skull hill, the God of the universe died for your sins. You are coming to a place far greater than Mount Sinai. This is to the lofty place of the pinnacles of God's sovereign decree to redeem a people for himself. This is his gift to you, and I hope you'll take home these thoughts and meditate on them and worship again and say, amazing, amazing. This is what God has done for me in his sovereign grace. And since I'm a pedagogue, I'll give you a reminder. There are 12 tribes of Israel, 12 disciples, so why not 12 points? Okay. Number one, let's take a look at the beginning of the suffering servant oracles in Isaiah 52, and we'll look at verses 13 through 15. It says, Behold, my servant shall act wisely. He shall be high and lifted up and shall be exalted. As many were astonished at you, his appearance was so marred beyond human semblance and his form beyond that of the children of mankind. So shall he sprinkle many nations. Kings shall shut their mouths because of him. For that which has not been told them they see, and that which they have not heard they understand. Here we see, if you will, God's sovereignty and salvation beginning to be spoken of in a prophetic way. As we prepare to enter into this text that brings together the future, the past, and the present all in one way. Let's make our first point to this, which is God's sovereignty of salvation in the very existence of the text of Isaiah. As you know, Isaiah is one of the great prophets. We call them the major prophets because of their length. The minor prophets are major in their message. They're just minor in their length. Now, did you know that Jesus, at the beginning of his ministry, had an Isaiah scroll given to him, and it was read. This is found in Luke chapter 4. And he said, today this text is fulfilled in your hearing. At the beginning of Jesus' ministry, he said, Isaiah is speaking of him. 
At the end of his ministry, the risen Lord in Luke 24 tells us that you need to read the entirety of the scriptures, the Torah, the prophets, and the writings, and see that they speak of him. Jesus unabashedly declared that the revelation of the Old Testament, which was his Bible, was all about himself. In fact, as we look at Isaiah, do you remember that the name Isaiah literally is the name of Jesus? Yes, yeah. Jesus. It means Yahweh saves. That's the name of Jesus. This is Jesus' book. In fact, St. Augustine long ago said, this book is the fifth gospel. For in this book we learn of the virgin birth in chapter 7. We learn of the Son of the Almighty God who's God in chapter 9. We learn about His cross and atonement in chapter 53. At the end, we learn about His extraordinary global kingdom and reign. And we also hear the good news, the gospel. It's proclaimed in this book. This, if you will, is the gospel before the gospels of Christ. In fact, it's interesting that there's so much of the story of Jesus in Isaiah 53 that some have been tempted to say it had to be a Christian interpolation into the ancient Isaiah text. But this has been utterly destroyed because the Dead Sea Scrolls had a full Isaiah scroll written at least 200 years before Christ and Isaiah 53 in all of its magnificent glory is there. In fact, this text is sometimes called the bad conscience of the synagogue. Perhaps you know that there is a tradition to read through the Torah, the first five books of the law of God, through each year in the worship of the Jewish synagogue. Going back to Alexander the Great as he attacked the Jewish people, he destroyed the reading of the Torah in their worship service by forbidding it. Can you imagine that? He wanted to keep the Jewish people under control by taking away their holy book. And so what did they do? They created what they called the Haftorah. They went through the rest of the writings of Scripture, and they took selections from the rest of the Old Testament that would remind them of the Torah they could not read. And of course, that was the scroll that was given to Jesus in Luke chapter 4. Isaiah is not in the Torah. It's in the Haftorah. And what's fascinating is that was being read that these different passages originally included Isaiah 53. But after the coming of Jesus, and especially after the Reformation, when Bible reading became part of the Christian church again, it has been removed from the reading in the synagogue. Now, there are good arguments why it happened. But at least one Jewish scholar, Raphael Levi, claims that it was always read in the Haftorah. But due to Jewish religious leaders becoming tired of the heated and great confusion it created for Jewish people, they simply stopped reading it. Now, I want to apologize to any Jewish listeners today. You may have a good argument, but this is one of your own historians that said it always was included. But it caused too many problems when they would read Isaiah 53, because somehow it sure sounds a lot like Jesus. I think that was God's intent. Isaiah 53, then, our first point, is God's sovereignty of salvation is manifested in the existence of Isaiah itself. Isaiah bears the name of Jesus. It was the book that began his ministry, and you'll find that he refers to it at least three times. In fact, if you go through the New Testament, almost every verse of Isaiah 53 is either cited or directly alluded to in the New Testament. It's there in many places, in John, in Peter, in Matthew, in Luke, Paul in Romans, and we find it at least three times in Jesus' teaching. God's sovereignty and salvation is seen first in the existence of the Isaiah scroll. But the verses that we just read a moment ago is our second point, and that is that God's purposes or sovereignty of salvation is seen 
And the fact that when he speaks prophetically, he is able to speak in the future, the present, and the past because he is sovereign over time itself. Notice as you look at those verses, Behold, my servant shall act wisely. He shall be high and lifted up and shall be exalted as many were astonished at you. Who is this you? A singular you. This is the Father speaking directly to the Messiah in the present tense and the past. Who can do such a thing except one who is sovereign over time itself? He speaks to the Messiah, and then he goes again to describe him in his experience. His appearance was so marred beyond human semblance, and his form beyond that of children of mankind. Then, so shall he sprinkle many nations. Kings shall shut their mouths, and they, what they have not heard, they understand. Past, present, future, all at one time, personalized to the one he's speaking about, and then he speaks of him all at the same time. Who can do such a thing? Only the sovereign God of history. The sovereignty of God is seen in the existence of Isaiah. The sovereignty of God is seen in that he's sovereign over the time of humanity in which his son will come. Our third point is that God is sovereign in granting saving faith itself, those that would believe in him. We see it in the first verse of the 53rd chapter. Who has believed what he has heard from us? Who has believed this message of the Messiah? It's a great question. Why do some believe and not others? Well, the second question gives us the answer in another question. And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? The reason there are some who believe and there are some who don't is because God is a sovereign God who reveals the power of his saving arm to those whom he has chosen. And as Jesus himself said, he blinds the eyes of the wise and prudent and reveals these things unto his children. God is sovereign in His salvation by the very questions that are asked. No one can believe but those to whom God's arm has been revealed. God is sovereign in salvation because He grants the gift by faith. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. That all, saving grace and faith, is a gift of God. Today, if you're a believer in Christ, do you stand amazed that God would give this to you? and not to someone else. Why you? It's the mystery of unspeakable mercy and grace, amazing grace, amazing love, stupendously amazing, to use a phrase from our Sunday school class today. Notice fourthly, the sovereignty of God is seen in the incarnation of the servant. You know the Christmas story. The Christmas story is... A king is born in history, and there's not even a crib for him except in a cattle stall. The stars in heaven know his coming and bring leaders from a far distant land. But where he comes, no one knows there's no room for him in the inn. He grows up as an unknown nobody with no regality, no sense of pomp and circumstance. He's the God of the universe in flesh, and he's an unknown God was sovereign in the incarnation. We see the sovereignty of God as we look at verse 2. For he grew up before him like a young plant and like a root out of dry ground. He had no former majesty that we should look at him and no beauty that we should desire him. He was just a humble, normal child among others, tucked away in a little town called Nazareth. And yet he was the Lord of glory. God was sovereign in the incarnation and all the events that surround him. God was sovereign in giving us Isaiah. God is sovereign in giving us the ability to look at past, present, and future at the same time because he's Lord of time. He is sovereign in giving us saving faith. He is sovereign in bringing at just the right time his Messiah, his Savior. In the fullness of time, he came forth to be born of a virgin, to be made flesh, to become our sacrifice for sin. We see further 
If you're numbering with me, I'm now on number five. The sovereignty of God is seen in His overcoming. The massive human depravity that needed to be made right before an utterly perfect, infinite God. We read this very clearly in verse 3. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, as one from whom men hide their faces. He was despised, and we esteemed him not. Human depravity was so great that when the Lord of glory came, all they could do is despise and ridicule and mock him, cause him suffering and pain, and finally kill him. That is the hatred of the human heart in fallenness and sin for redemption to become possible by it being overcome. When we use the phrase total depravity, we do not mean that human beings are as evil as they possibly could be. But it means that in every part of our being, in the totality of who we are, every part stands against the beauty and holiness and glory of God. We set God aside for the idols of our hearts to make ourselves lords of our lives so that we are the masters of our faith, the captains of our soul, so we can do what we want. We might accommodate God if we can make a bargain, but He's not sovereign. The sovereignty of God is seen in the massive human depravity that had to be overcome, that when this glorious, perfect one came, this was the sin that had to be addressed. Further, we see that God is sovereign in our salvation in verses 4 and 5, 6, in His accomplished penal substitutionary atonement. By penal, we mean punishment. Substitutionary, meaning taking the place of another. Atonement, meaning the sacrifice that makes enemies one so that they're reconciled. Today, this is a doctrine that is despised by liberal theology. We can't believe in shedding of some human blood that would make one right with a holy God. That's cosmic child abuse. It's slaughterhouse religion. No, this is the price of overcoming the massive sin that the holy, perfect one who knew no sin, utterly fully God and fully man in one person, that it was his infinite sacrifice alone by his taking our place, by bearing our punishment, that we could become one with God. Today, if you have not come to this cross, to this shedding of this blood, of this sacrifice, of this punishment taken in your place. You remain in your sin and you are separated from God. There's only but one way. Jesus said, I am the way and the truth and the life, and no one comes unto the Father except through me. You must come by way of the cross or you will not find God. It is His sacrifice. It is His penal substitutionary atonement that is accomplished, already accomplished in the Old Testament before it happened in time because it's decreed by a sovereign God as the means, the way, the only way that we can become right with God. Have you come unto this Christ who died for sinners and rose again to give them life? God is sovereign in His salvation. Seventhly, in the gracious imputation of sin onto the sacrificed, suffering Savior. Now, that's a mouthful. Let me say it again. God is sovereign in our salvation. Seventhly, in the gracious imputation of sin onto the sacrificed, suffering Savior. That's verse 6. Listen. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. What we are reading is that with our wicked unbelief, with our making everything else idols in the place of God, 
as we make ourselves the most important one of the universe, our sin of breaking covenant and violating God's law, all of that sin God took and he put upon Christ on the cross. It was imputed to him. He who know no sin became sin for us. Why? That we might become the righteousness of God in Jesus Christ. There's a double imputation. It's called the greatest transaction in history where all of human guilt and sin and death and punishment was placed upon the shoulders upon Jesus Christ on the cross for His people. And His perfect life that met every standard of God is ours. The sovereignty of God alone can make this transaction possible. This is what you receive when you reach out with beggar's hands and say, I need a Savior. I cannot save myself. Have you received this gift? For God so loved this world that He gave His Son to bear your guilt and to give you His righteousness that you might have life that never ends. Do you see how heinous your sin is? If you can say God would pay such a price and I don't need it and I don't want Him. Like the little red hen, I can do it myself. You can't do it. You need the Savior. And so, eighthly, we see the sovereignty of God in our salvation in the prophetic declaration of the passion of the suffering Savior. In the prophetic declaration of the passion of the suffering Savior, we see God's sovereignty because He prophetically tells us what happens in the week of Christ's suffering centuries before it was to occur. We read this in verses 7 to 9. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. Like a lamb that is led to the slaughter and like a sheep that before its shears is silent, so he opened not his mouth. Does that sound like Jesus standing before Pontius Pilate? By oppression and judgment, he was taken away. Does that sound like the kangaroo court that violated all of Jewish law that was held in the middle of the night that condemned him without a trial? And as for his generation, who considered that he was cut off out of the land of the living, stricken for the transgression of my people? Who was alive when this happened and said, don't you see this one's dying for our sin? Not even his disciples believed it. They ran and hid. They were terrified. They didn't understand what he had told them. Three times he said, I must go to Jerusalem. I will be crucified by sinners and I will rise from the... They could not understand it. This was predicted all before it happened. And how about this, verse 9? And they made his grave with the wicked and with a rich man in his death, although he had done no violence. And there was no deceit in his mouth. The greatest injustice ever that happened in the world. How could it be possible that one who is so hideously killed, so fully repudiated, so completely abandoned, is now given a rich man's tomb of honor? It makes no sense, but God said it would be. And in this we see then the prophetic declaration of the passion of the suffering Savior. God is saying, I'm sovereign over history. This is the way it will be. And that is why Jesus will say at the end of the Gospel of Luke, just before His cross, all that is written about my suffering must come to pass. And He alludes directly to this passage. This was Jesus' text. He knew that his hour had come because he had read the book that bears his name, Isaiah, Jesus, Yahweh saves. We see in the ninth example of the sovereignty of God in what theologians might call the fulfillment of the Pactum Salutis, the covenant of salvation in the eternal counsel of God, the fulfillment of the Counsel of God, verse 10. Let us read it. 
Yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him. God determined that this was the way that salvation could. It was his will. It was not an accident. It was not an overcoming of Jesus by the uh, evil of Satan. It was God's purpose that it would happen this way because this is the price that sin must have to make one right with God. God put him to grief. When his soul makes an offering for guilt, now notice this. We now come to the tenth example of God's sovereignty. It's not just that he fulfills the will of heaven, but he will conquer death itself. Did you miss it? Look at the end of verse 10. He shall see his offspring. He shall prolong his days. The will of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. He will die, but he will live, and he will see those that abandoned him and left him. He will look upon those with the light of life. A promise of the resurrection after the suffering. In the fulfillment of the pactum salutis, we find then the next, number 10, the satisfying, sufficient atonement of the Son proven by the resurrection. That's what verse 11 says, Out of the anguish of his soul he shall see and be satisfied. As we look at those words, it's an amazing thought to think about this, that Jesus will look at his finished work. He will say it is finished and be satisfied. He has completed all that the Father had called him to do. Reformed theologians here see the L of the tulip. He completed his death for everyone for whom it was intended, and he did not lose one. The will of the Lord prospers in his hand, and out of the anguish of his soul he shall see and be satisfied. He won't say, I wish I could have done more. I didn't quite get it done. It is finished, paid in full. I will not lose my sheep. No one can pluck them out of my hand. I lay down my life for the sheep. You are not of my sheep, therefore you cannot hear my word. But my sheep hear my voice and they follow me. Christ has died and he is saved. He's accomplished his work. Will you notice in 11, our 11th point is the sovereignty of God is seen in the justification of sinners. Notice the second half of the verse. It says, And by his knowledge shall the righteous one, my servant, make many to be accounted righteous. I would like to change the Hebrew just slightly, because I think it can be translated this way. By the knowledge of him shall the righteous one, my servant, make many to be accounted righteous. The sovereignty of God has given us the Apostle Paul's doctrine of justification by faith right here in this verse. They will be declared righteous by knowing him. Do you know him? That's how we become right with him. The righteousness of Christ is credited to our account. And then finally, our 12th point, in the fulfillment of the prophecy of the glorification of the Savior, we see the sovereignty of God. The Lord said, after this incredible story I've told you, you're going to see that He will be world famous. He will touch the globe. All men will know about Him. He will be among the greats. Listen to what verse 12 says. Therefore... In light of his accomplished work, his justifying work, his satisfying the Father's wrath through his double a, a, a imputation, therefore I will divide him a portion with the many, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out his soul to death and was numbered with the transgressors, that he bore the sin of many and makes intercession for transgressors. Well, each of those points could be a whole lecture in its own right. We went high speed through holy ground. But may I make these final questions as applications for our lives today? Let me say that this is no text for you if you're an Arminian. <laughs> if you want this text, you need to say, God is sovereign. This is not a God who says, I'm not sure what I'm going to do next. He said, this is the way it is, and I have done it, and this is my will. Secondly, this text brings extraordinary hope for sinners. 
So God can't save someone like no. The full weight of the sin of every one of God's people was entirely thrust upon him. This means there's hope for you. Take your most embarrassing, heinous sin and say, Lord, can you forgive me? And he says, look at my cross that I predicted eight centuries before it were to happen. This is for you. Saint, you struggle with your salvation. How can you know you're really saved? Read Isaiah 53 and say, how could I not be Christ's if he did all this? And it was established so long before he came. Surely I belong to him and nothing can separate me from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. For the doubter here today who struggles with the reliability of Scripture, read Isaiah 53 again and say, I dare you to find anything that's ever come close to predicting the future with such unexpected accuracy and clarity. The whole story of the New Testament flows out of these words. The Word of God can be trusted. It is a revelation from heaven. For those of you that are Bible interpreters, may I suggest a hermeneutic, a way of reading Scripture that reflects Jesus? He said, I don't care where I'm reading in the Old Testament, it's about me. This text shows us, if you with blinking lights, the Old Testament is the book about Jesus. You don't look for Jesus in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and John. You look for Jesus in his Bible that naturally brings you to Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. The Bible is about Christ. Friends, if you refuse to believe today, do you hear the warning? Do you understand that God has paid this price for sinners and you are spurning his wisdom? You say you can do it without him, you can do it on your own. Do you realize the insult that you are bringing to the sovereign God of the universe whose grace is written in large words in Isaiah 53? Dare you spurn that and not come to him? Is your Redeemer? If you are struggling with the old-fashioned gospel that sings songs like, what can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. I can't sing that. Then you can't read Isaiah 53. Because that's what it says. It is only the sacrifice of Christ that can take away our sin. It is by His shed blood that our sins are forgiven. He is the great Lamb of God, the sacrifice the penal substitutionary sacrifice that takes away the sin of the world. And then finally, today, if you're worshiping today on holy ground, do you have a sense of doxology today? Do you have a desire? I just want to worship this God that loved me so much, that gave me so much revelation. Well, to that end, if you can, stand with me and let's sing the doxology together and praise our God. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above ye heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. Lord, by your grace, would you open every heart to worship you, to trust you, to know you. Remove from us our sin as far as the east is from the west. And for the sake of your suffering servant, remember it no more. In his name we pray. Amen. Is there a final hymn or are we done? We're done. Okay. God bless you. Thank you for coming. <laughs>